Good morning for most of the Asian country people. Today, we are going to talk about a greater Asia, its role, its future, and its responsibility. Do you know how many countries there are in the world? Almost 130 and more, possibly. Among these countries, there are 49 countries which belong to Asian continent. However, among the six continents, the Asia, uh, in terms of its region, occupies 30% of the total Earth. But more importantly, uh, two-thirds of the population of the world reside in Asia. And more importantly, uh, among these 45, uh, 4.5 billion people in Asia, the growing number of population uh, is with the young generation uh, compared to aged generation in other, in other continents. What that means is the future belongs to Asia. They say by 2040, Asia and especially uh, Southeast Asian countries will be leading uh, not only in uh, population and other aspects, but also in economy, finance, and even technology. So with this uh, future trend uh, as a kind of platform, we'll be talking about the Asian economy, technology, finance. One of the problems these Asian countries have is that because of this uh, corona pandemic, uh, the, strong, the stronghold in trade and manufacturing have been set back, while their relative weaknesses in finance and technology will be uh, sort of limiting uh, their economic growth. Having said this condition, we have two uh, speakers who will be leading us uh, to the future of Asian countries in general. The first person we will be uh, having as the distinguished speaker will be uh, Sheng Bing, uh, Bing Sheng, uh, who, is, who used to be a professor at University of Peking, but uh, in the last 18 years, he has been the founding dean of the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, which is a leading business school not only in China, but also in the world, especially for its uh, alumni group of more than 10,000 people who are respectively the economic leaders in China. And uh, Xiang Bing has been the pioneer in economic development in Asia and in China. And also he has been a kind of spokesperson of the Chinese economy, uh, its growth, its trend, and its future. So now let me introduce Professor and Founding Dean Xiang Bing of Chang Kong Graduate School of Business. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Cho, for your kind introduction. And it's uh, hi, everyone. And it's always a delight and a privilege to be here to share with you my views on this, not only economy in China, Southeast Asia, or East Asia, and the global economy. And today, I would like to share with you my remarks on the era for economic disruption and the social innovation. And, and uh, I have this uh, four issues to be covered in this 10 minutes. Number one, I would like to start with the Confucian economic sphere and the East Asia. Then I will turn to economic disruptions and the importance of promoting social innovation. And then, and then I will talk about uh, some experiments or innovations we have had in CKGSB in fostering economic disruption and social innovation. For the role of Confucian economic sphere, I wrote up this article in 2017. 
Uh, when I talk about Confucian economic sphere, I'm talking about societies or economies significantly shaped by Confucianism. So this would include mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, you know, the greater China, and, and well, as well, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Vietnam. So there's eight economies. According to the study by World Bank, uh, among the 101 economies defined as mid-income ones in 1960, only 13 of them have succeeded in overcoming the mid-income trap by 2008. Five out of 13 successful ones actually coming from Confucian economic sphere, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And in 2018, Macau also succeeded. So this is a six out of eight economy succeeded in overcoming the mid-income trap. This is very high percentage. So only two left are mainland China and Vietnam. So this percentage of success is much higher than the global average. And in 2015, the first time ever, the combined nominal GDP of Confucian economic sphere surpassed those of US and EU respectively. So it has emerged as the largest economic block in the world. And, 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 and also you can see last year, 202 foreign global companies coming from this region. So more than 40% of the global companies also coming from the Confucian economic sphere. This economic success of the Confucian economic sphere is striking in the sense we have so much diversity in political systems. You look at the political system across greater China, the mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, and you look at the political system differences between Korea, Japan, Singapore, Vietnam. So despite all these disparities in political system, in size of population, in levels of development. So the Confucian economic sphere, collectively, we all have done well economically. So that gave me a sense of confidence when I look at the future of the Asian economy, especially the Confucian economic sphere. And if you look at role of East Asian, you know, the combined the GDP was about 27.6%. So look at, you know, 10 plus three, China, Japan, Korea, plus ASEAN. So last year we contributed about 27.6% of the global GDP and 24.4% of the global trade in merchandise. So we're by far the largest economic block globally. And if you're counting the economic growth or increment I'm also positive we are the number one contributor to global economic growth. And uh, actually the first quarter of this year, the 10 ASEAN countries, the trade, the 10 ASEAN countries have surpassed European Union to become China's largest trading partner. So you see the potential com complementarities even within this 10 plus three economic block. So this is the first issue to be shared with you. The second one is economic disruptions. What I mean by economic disruptions? Uh, I've been looking at this issue for some time uh, for my uh, uh, keynote last year at the Singapore Management University, I expressed my thinking uh, of economic disruption. But the idea of economic disruption is central to economic development, prosperity, and social harmony. China is noted for its substantive and continued economic disruption in terms of newly emerged large scale companies and newly minted billionaires in the past three or four decades. China has been probably the best example in this regard. China may not be the best in innovations. Let's take a look at uh, the economic disruptions when you compare that of China with India. In 1978, GDP-wise, 
a GDP per capita of India was higher than that of China. And 2019, this is about 40 years later, can see China's GDP is five times bigger than that of India. One of the reasons for this disparities uh, between the economic performance of China and India is I think is the extent of economic disruptions. Uh, you can see the number of billionaires in China, in mainland China, only one. And as of today, we have 389. In India, four, now they have 102. And also you look at uh, the change in the list of richest people in some of the selected country or economies. Like for example, the 2010, these are the list of 10 richest people in mainland China. And look at the 2020, you see not a single one of them on the list of 2010 stay on the list of 10 richest people in mainland China in 2020. You see a sea change. There's always new kids on the block disrupting these. Uh, uh, so this is uh, in comparison with what you see in India. You know, India, the top 10 richest people, maybe half have changed. And Japan, you know, only four uh, are the new ones on the list. Uh, Korea, you have more as well. So in terms of uh, uh, newly rich and in terms of new large companies, uh, China doing well in both front. For example, uh, China contributed seven companies to the global 500. Uh, 2020, uh, China contributed 117. You look at the case of India, they had one in 1999, they have seven companies on the list of 2020. The Chinese economy enjoyed far more extensive economic disruptions than compared with that of India. That's one of the differences between Chinese economic development and India one. And if you look into the future, the number of unicorn companies may be an indicator of the forthcoming economic disruptions. Uh, in this regard, uh, this is the newest uh, list of global unicorn companies uh, as compiled on October 29th, uh, this is just a few days ago. See, United States still the leading one with about 48% uh, of the global. Uh, this is uh, global, the top one is 494. China contributed 24.7%, <clears throat> excuse me. So 122 companies. And then uh, you see, Japan, Korea contributing nine, Japan only contributing four. So if you compare China with Japan, Japan is noted for its excellence in innovations, but definitely Japan has not been doing well in economic disruption for the past two or three decades. If number of unicorn companies is, is an indicator of forthcoming disruptions, may Japan may continue not to do well in the future. And social innovation. Uh, I mean, I mean, what I mean by social innovation, uh, you know, at least of CKGSB, we 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 don't pay much uh, attention to issues or ranking. We always look into the future, look at the, the issues uh, facing societies, whether it's economic or social issues. You know, so when we look at the three most pressing issues, among the most pressing issues, like income, wealth, inequality, diminishing social mobility and sustainability. We always ask ourselves what we can do as a business school to help you know, meeting these challenges. And then when I look at the three issues, with now the three issues can be settled by government, by business, uh, by NGOs, by civil society, and by international organization if they go solo. So we would like to advance and promote a partnership between government, business, NGOs, civil societies, and international organizations to focus on those three issues. You know? So this is what we mean by social innovation. And our school has been trying to combining this foster economic disruptions and promoting social innovations since 2015. 
In 2015, the first program of this type was set up by CKGSP Tencent, co-branded program, targeting companies with um, chairman CEOs of the A round of funding, company with A round of funding. In 2016, they had a second program of this type, the CKGSP Baidu program, targeting chairman CEOs of companies with C round of funding. 2017, we had a CKGSP GID.com program, focus on companies with FinTech. And then we had a co-branded program with Microsoft, the SoftBank China Capital, targeting companies that are more AI driven or more IoT type of companies, you know. And then, uh, you know, we also work with uh, IDG Capital and some of the leading PVC company in China. And then, and then last year, uh, we had a new program this type by working with ByteDance, the parent companies of TikTok, you know. And then uh, this year, we had a first co-branded program with Alibaba, CKGSB Alibaba, to focus on digital transformation, AI. And the first degree program this time is the one we have with UC Berkeley Engineering, Master of Entrepreneurship and Technology Innovations, you know. And also we have paid attention to this new generation of family business leaders. You know, in China, most of the forthcoming business leaders are second generation. So, so our next generation family business leaders program also have done well to prepare the new generation business leaders to embrace for many kinds of disruptions for years to come. Also, the program this time, um, we started in Europe as well. Our China Start program is already, uh, this year's eight cohorts already. And also of uh, the first program of this time by working together with Churchill College, Cambridge, actually uh, started yesterday. I, I did a talk for them yesterday, opening uh, remarks for that program. And I will also we experiment a similar program in Asia. For example, our ASEAN program, and also our COVID-19 driven digitalization program. I will also have this program this time line up. We have the one I hope for Japan, which could be offered in 2021, was University of Tokyo, Waseda University. I hope we can offer similar program in Korea by co-branding with Assist Yonsei University. We we'll offer similar program, Latin America, Africa, and Oceania program as well. And then, uh, so for the future, we would like folks this type of program uh, by concentrating two focal points. One is the family business, a matter of a family succession. How do we make sure the next generation family business leaders not only do well for their family business and wealth preservation, but also with more emphasis on social innovation. And also we have this disruption program, which is more focused upon unicorn, a unicorn companies to be. And so this is the social innovation module was offered as elective module for our EMBA FMB 2017. Now is required module for EMBA MBA and all degree program since 2018. So this is uh, probably some experiment we have done to promote the social mobility, to mitigate income wealth inequality issue for the past few years. And I think this, uh, uh, you know, I think I would like to work together with uh, the more educational institutions in this undertaking. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share with you my views. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Changbing. And now I have the pleasure of introducing to you the second speaker, Joel Neo. Uh, Joel Neo is a founder and CEO of FAVE, which is one of Asia, Southeast Asia's fastest growing fintech platform, uh, which enables digital payments and merchant solutions. And he is also co-founder of Groupong in Asia and SAIS, which is in investment uh, in uh, startups, disruptive technology, and so on. It seems that Joel Neo is one of the best examples of how Southeast Asia can become a leading economy in the world. And here, 
we have Joel Neo. Joel, you have the platform. All right. Good morning. Um, firstly, thanks uh, you know, to the organizers for having me here. Uh, over the next uh, 10 minutes, I'll share a little bit about uh, Southeast Asia, myself, the tech industry, and uh, really looking forward to questions um, after this uh, session. Yeah. So as, um, so as one of the, you know, the, the future generations uh, you know, of Southeast Asia, I want to share a little bit of background, right? Like how it began for me. So my great-grandfather uh, you know, was from Hainan and uh, you know, in the early 20th century, uh, you know, he, he took a boat right? and uh, you know, with a couple of uh, family members or friends and he sailed uh, all the way down to uh, Malaysia. So I'm actually um, uh, the fourth uh, generation uh, uh, you know, Malaysian, uh, Chinese Malaysian, uh, you know, after my grandfather, my father and myself. So when we think about, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, like these are uh, some of the pictures, right, of uh, Malaysia uh, in which, uh, you know, the, the junk boat uh, or one examples of uh, the boats in which uh, my great-grandfather uh, had uh, set for days, right, to reach uh, Malaysia. Uh, my family members or my ancestors, they were living in villages such as this. Uh, Malaysia and many Southeast Asian countries was colonized, um, you know, by the West and at some points by uh, the Japanese. So during the time, uh, you know, before independence, we were colonized by the British. So there was uh, very minimal freedom. And uh, most of, uh, you know, Chinese immigrants that moved to Malaysia, uh, they were workers, right, in the uh, farms or they were workers in the shops. Um, and that's when uh, in... Uh, in 1957, uh, Malaysia, amongst uh, many of the Southeast Asian countries during that period, got its independence. Uh, so, uh, to some extent, uh, Malaysia is uh, close to 63 years old as an independent country, uh, and therefore relatively uh, a young country. So, what's uh, unique or, or beautiful about the Southeast Asia region as well, there hasn't been uh, much of a major war, right? So, it's actually quite, uh, it's been quite peaceful. Uh, of course, there are some, uh, you know, small battles or civil wars, uh, you know, in, in different countries, but no major war in our region over the past 50 years. And uh, this peace has actually um, set up uh, the generation like myself uh, to believe in uh, dreaming big. Yeah, so this is me when I was five years old. So when I grew up, uh, my parents uh, was asking me, you know, what do I want to be? And I remember, uh, you know, feeling that I had the opportunity to be whoever and whatever I want to be. Yeah? So I was a big dreamer uh, at uh, age of five in 1988. And then when I started to go to school uh, in the early uh, 1990s, uh, I realized that uh, my parents, very similar to all uh, uh, you know, Chinese uh, uh, you know, uh, Desen parents in, in uh, Malaysia or Southeast Asia, there's nothing more important to them than education. So uh, this was me receiving a book prize award uh, I got 98 out of 100 for uh, math, uh, mathematics, and uh, that's not good enough for my parents. So they were always pushing me to study harder and, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, 100 may not be enough. You know, they would expect uh, me to get like 110 out of 100, yeah, for, um, you know, for my studies. So I uh, grew up in an environment, environment whereby uh, my parents was also expecting me to uh, be a professional. So in their view, uh, my future has only four options. It's either being a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or accountant, uh, because they came from a, a generation where uh, they were struggling and they wanted to make sure that uh, their children, uh, which is myself, had a good future ahead or a safe and stable future ahead for them. So in year 2000 was the first time uh, within my uh, you know, uh, close family members uh, that uh, we went, I went overseas. Yeah? So uh, my parents, they, were, they had very li little mobility. Um, my, my dad did not even, uh, you know, was not even on a plane until just 10 years ago. So uh, you know, they were very proud you know, to send me to the airport where I kind of took off for the first time uh, about 20 years ago. So I was in Australia and I was doing this uh, project uh, where we, I was representing uh, Malaysia as a country uh, for an engineering project in which... Um, you know, we, um, you know, we were, uh, this, this is the picture of uh, that, that particular project. So I was also uh, one of the first uh, person uh, in the family to obtain a degree. And that is uh, considered, uh, you know, uh, an achievement. Uh, and uh, parents were very happy, very proud. 
they made a lot of copies. They photocopied this uh, certificate and started to send it out uh, to a lot of companies to get me interviews uh, for a job. As uh, you know, my parents are very concerned about my uh, future. They wanted to make sure I had a stable uh, job as an engineer. Uh, and over the past, uh, since graduating, I've uh, also kind of uh, studied or invested uh, you know, in, in education. So personally, uh, I've been a CKGSB, a fantastic uh, university. Uh, very proud uh, to be on this uh, same panel with uh, Professor Xiangping. And um, I've also been to the US uh, in HBS uh, and also doing a program in, in uh, you know, uh, another university in China. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is also part and parcel of that, the background uh, that I came from. Both my mom and my dad, they are educationists. My mom's a teacher in my school. And my dad is a, uh, you know, he works in a university in Malaysia. But unfortunately, to uh, my parents, uh, you know, uh, kind of disbelief, I decided to be an entrepreneur. So I'm also one of the first uh, in my family. And there uh, were many of, uh, like my friends, who were also first in their family to start off their own business. Because uh, my parents, my grandparents, they're all used to work in, uh, you know, with the government or, uh, you know, previously to that, they were workers in, uh, in the fields. So, um, yeah, so they didn't really understand uh, what I did. Uh, I started that journey uh, as an entrepreneur when I was 21 years old. And since then, uh, I've built four uh, internet companies um, uh, from 2008 onwards. So, uh, the first company I built was an online news platform. Uh, what I learned and realized was uh, many of my friends, the younger generation, we were not looking at uh, newspapers or television. We were actually looking at online websites for a uh, source of news. So we built uh, one of the largest news platform within a couple of years. Uh, and then we uh, acquired many different local news companies to create a digital media group called Ref Asia, uh, which we took uh, our IPO. We went public in Malaysia and eventually got acquired by the largest traditional media company uh, in Malaysia. I've also built uh, an e-commerce platform. Uh, it's called Groupon across uh, 10 countries in Asia Pacific. So within uh, four years, we built it to a $2 billion company. Um, and, um, and follow on from then, I uh, left because I wanted to be an entrepreneur again. And in the past five years, I've been building a mobile uh, payments or QR payments platform called Faith. So, um, yep, so the first platform I built, uh, e-commerce platform was acquired in 2010 by Groupon. Uh, we went public in 2012 uh, on the NASDAQ. Uh, in 2015, the digital media company uh, that I started, uh, we went IPO as well in 2015, and we got acquired by uh, the largest traditional media company uh, in Malaysia. Um, we, uh, right now, I'm building this uh, QR payment loyalty app, uh, which is called Faith. Uh, you know, some of you, uh, maybe it's quite similar to uh, some of the apps that you use in China, whether is it uh, Alipay or WeChat Pay, or in Korea, uh, that will be Kakao Pay. So we've raised about 30 million US dollars to date. And now I'm going to share a little bit about uh, you know, the, the landscape uh, in Southeast Asia and what I've experienced. So if you look at the past 10 years, that has been uh, the rise of the golden age uh, for Southeast Asia tech companies. In the past two years itself, uh, tech companies like uh, ourselves, we've raised a total of 16 billion US dollars, right? So it's compared to uh, China, uh, it's still a small uh, amount, but if we look at the past two years, we've actually, the funding has been uh, uh, significant more, higher than any of the eight years prior to that. And it's been growing at a 76% year-on-year growth. So the, in Southeast Asia, these are some of the more uh, attractive industries where uh, investors uh, are actually putting money in. Uh, the first is logistics and transportation, so enabling uh, you know, whether is it uh, very similar models uh, like in China called TT, we have one, uh, we have a few here, uh, which is Grab and, and Gojek. Uh, E-commerce is also growing very rapidly in this region. Uh, you know, we have platforms like Lazada and Shopee, uh, which are also uh, funded and owned by uh, Alibaba and, and Tencent. And thirdly, we have uh, a lot of investments coming in recently into fintech. Uh, payments as the region goes through a transformation from cash to cashless, um, there is uh, going to be a lot more financial services available for consumers and merchants. Uh, and that's the area that Faith is building in. So the, if we look back in the past 100 years, uh, you know, what has uh, significantly changed is the market opportunities. 
So perhaps uh, in the past 50 years, it was the rise of uh, you know, the US, Japan, Europe. Uh, but uh, from, from, you know, from the past 10 years, we see that uh, shifting towards uh, China, India, and Southeast Asia. The way we should think about it is a multi-country market, uh, quite similar to Europe. So in a sense where it's not one country, but it's actually 10 different countries, 10 different uh, laws and regulations. But um, you know, there is uh, efforts from governments to closely need it. Uh, to create more uh, economic development opportunities. So when we think about uh, technology companies in the Southeast Asia, uh, we are probably in the third generation of, uh, of uh, technology companies. Uh, it started in 19, the, uh, 1995, right, uh, whereby the telco infrastructure was laid in, the, in this region. Um, and then uh, somewhere in the um, early 2005, 2006, 3G, uh, technology was rolled out and that enabled uh, or accelerated Internet 1.0, which is e-commerce platforms, travel e-commerce platforms, and to some extent, some media and advertising platforms, like the ones I built in 2008. Uh, then we went through a revolution, uh, Internet 2.0, when 4G kicked in. So when 4G came into Southeast Asia, that enabled video, that enabled high, richer content. So therefore, you have um, you know, better e-commerce platforms, better social media platforms, uh, and, and fintech, the rise of fintech to uh, support digital payments uh, online. And now as we kind of, uh, in the past five years, we are seeing a hybrid of now offline businesses going digital and uh, digital payments going mobile so that uh, anyone that has a mobile phone is able to access uh, all these uh, benefits of technology. And if you kind of mark the different kind of uh, company categories between Southeast Asia in green and China in blue, you will see that a lot of the internet 2.0 and 3.0 platforms in Southeast Asia has actually not gone IPO. Whereas in China, there has been numerous IPOs in this particular uh, sector. So China is probably at least five years, uh, three to five years ahead of Southeast Asia, uh, uh, you know, or perhaps even, uh, uh, you know, probably beyond that uh, ahead. But, uh, you know, in the next 10 years will be that golden age for Southeast Asia where uh, you know, uh, we're forecasted there will be a lot more IPOs, especially in the internet 2.0 and 3.0 countries. As I kind of uh, close, close in the last few uh, slides, um, you know, what has also become quite interesting where uh, venture capital funding uh, or entrepreneurs have started to come to Southeast Asia to build uh, businesses for this region and also to export from Southeast Asia to the world is because um, it, uh, some of the countries are climbing up the ranks and becoming uh, you know, places that is easy to do business. So, so Singapore is number two in the world uh, for ease of doing business. Malaysia, where I reside, is number 12 in the world, and we've jumped six ranks since 2015. Um, governance, I think, is one a very important factor as well. So Korea leads in terms of uh, you know, really good governance, of, uh, corporate governance, in which uh, you know, strong transparency uh, and low corruption. Uh, in which Southeast Asia has improved significantly over the past 15, 20 years, um, you know, coming or catching up to, to the levels uh, where, uh, you know, where you see in, in China. And um, I think the CPI or Corruption uh, uh, Perception Index, I think is quite important for also uh, more foreign direct investments to come to our region. So as I kind of close off on my presentation and go into uh, you know, Q&A uh, after this, uh, you know, what kind of keeps me up uh, at night is thinking of now the next generation, which is the fifth generation. Uh, so that would be my family, right? And, uh, and it's, uh, it's the start of the 21st uh, century. So as, uh, you know, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father kind of went through the struggles in the 20th century, right? Coming to a junk boat, living in a village. They were, you know, colonized by the British and before that by the Japanese and they were workers in the fields. You know, I think that we are all... Um, you know, we, we are all guardians uh, you know, to make sure that we kind of, we, we, we make all that worth it and, uh, you know, be the guardians of the next generation and making sure that, you know, they live a better life. They have better social mobility, uh, you know, better freedom, uh, you know, of, uh, and safety uh, for, for their families and also better jobs uh, and better income that they're able to support their families. So I think, uh, you know, that's, um, Something I think that's important as we think about Asia moving forward and being one of the leading, if not the leading uh, region or continent for the world. So with that, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. And I uh, just want to credit Asia Partners and Tech in Asia for a lot of the data that I presented today in my, in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Now it's time for dialogue. Well, first of all, uh, Dean Xiangbing, uh, 
You mentioned or you identified two key factors for success of Asian economy. The first one is Confucian culture. The second one is economic disruption and social innovation. How would you explain the success of Jewel, uh, uh, albeit very young, uh, with these two characteristics you mentioned? Uh, because uh, it seems to me that uh, Jewel uh, identified or perceived market opportunities there, but uh, using his background in education at CKGSP and Harvard Business School, uh, he made it what happened. So, uh, Din Xiang, how, how would you please explain his success for the potential followers of Jewel? Well, uh, you know, like one of the reasons for China's economic success is the size of population. The reason I compared China with that of India is as two countries uh, had a similar size in population. But China, at least for the past 30, 40 years, did much better uh, in terms of economic performance. Uh, I want to illustrate the role of economic disruptions in promoting economic prosperity. And in that regard, I think, number one, I think emphasis on education is very important. It's a central element of uh, Confucianism. I think, uh, you know, of the eight economy we, I'm talking about here, uh, that's the one common element, you know, emphasis on, on, on education. And you can see these, uh, 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 you know, the, these, uh, uh, and also emphasis on hard work as well. This is an emphasis on family. <laughs> uh, I'm providing uh, uh, um, uh, not only for your generation, the caring for next generation, you know. So all, all of those are really essential. But according to the experience of our MBA program, in the very beginning, when, I, when we set up the MBA program in China, most of the graduates would say, well, I, I want to go to work for Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, you know, really become a really good professional management. So that's a career path. But if you look at the past, let's say 10 years or so, uh, I think some top graduates would like to go become an entrepreneur, and then the, if not a majority of them. So I, I, I do see a sea change even in China, change of culture, change of what I want to do with my life, you know. So I want uh, maybe I want to see more of this in Korea, in Japan, you know, you have a more advanced economy, you know, and, and uh, so not even a lot, a lot of top talents, you know, from Universal Tokyo, they said, well, we want to work for government. We want to work for this top six, seven, eight company in Japan. So that was, that has been their dream, you know. But if no economic disruptions, whatever political system you have, you may have issues of political stability. You see the case of France, Chile, Chile as well. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Joel, I have a question. Well, you are a product of CQJSP, as well as Harvard Business School, which I also attended. And didn't you have any uh, sort of urge, uh, like uh, Bill Gates or Zuckerberg, to uh, cut your education in the middle and go to industry, rather than finishing these two prestigious schools? In other words, were the education in CKGSP and Harvard Business School helpful to you? Yeah, so, um, so definitely very helpful. Um, I, I think that education is lifelong. Uh, it's a lifelong learning process. Um, and because the world is changing very quickly, um, and uh, there was a reason why I went to Harvard Business School in, um, you know, about 10 years ago. Uh, because I was uh, given an opportunity to become, uh, to take over the Asia Pacific business for mm. an American company. Mm. So I became from an entrepreneur to become uh, uh, an executive. And that's something I needed to learn. Uh, and I, I, it was an American company and therefore kind of understanding the culture, the values and what's important uh, is, is key. The reason why I went to CKGSB is because uh, China, and, uh, China is very close to Southeast Asia. In fact, uh, Southeast Asia mirrors a lot of uh, China and my experience uh, mm. you know, CKJSB has been fantastic. Mm. Um, it really inspired me to uh, start what I, I did because um, when I went to China, I realized that nobody was using cash. <laughs> you know, I had a lot of, uh, I brought so much cash and I couldn't even get a McDonald's burger because they didn't want to accept my money. 
So I thought this has got to be the future in Southeast Asia in the next five years or maybe 10 years. And that really uh, got me started with faith. So I really thank you, right, for that opportunity, Professor Samping. Great. So Joel is thankful to Bing Xiang for his success. Thank you. Great. Well, we have a number of interesting questions from the audience. And the first uh, question is, how can the East Asian economy or Southeast Asian economy uh, move from consumption and, you know, uh, from export and trade-driven economy to consumption and innovation-driven economy. Well, it seems that Joel has been at the forefront of such attempt, but uh, can Joel answer this, uh, echoed by Bing Sheng? Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, the reason why I started internet companies or technology companies is because I, I had no opportunity to start a, a company that was uh, in trading because that was an, uh, that was an old generation uh, uh, um, you know, business. So uh, when I look at my parents, they were just teachers, educationists. Uh, there was no way for me to start in that business because uh, 50 or 30 years ago, there were many entrepreneurs uh, and, my and my parents' generation who have started that. Um, so yeah, so we had to innovate. Uh, if not, we were not able to compete. So that's why we built digital platforms instead of doing trading and taking an inventory and being heavy cash flow, we built asset light, we built uh, you know, uh, businesses so that uh, it doesn't require us um, yeah, to raise too much money uh, when we first started the business. Mm. Well, I have the second question to Bing Sheng. That is that uh, some of the uh, concerns we have in this Asia, Asian region is uh, corona pandemic. And although we have a number of heroes like Jewel in fintech, but still, uh, East Asian economy, Southeast Asian economy are still heavily dependent upon manufacturing and trade, which has had been devastated by the uh, corona pandemic. And Din Xiang, do you have any solutions uh, for uh, sort of coming out of this pandemic uh, in manufacturing and trade? Well, uh... I think these two issues really related, you know, like for the future, uh, our economies uh, must be innovation driven because the U.S. has been a dominating power because uh, it, it becomes ingenuity American people. You know, they have uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, Cisco, then, then Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know, this type of innovations, you know. The innovation power of the U.S., not only in this type of companies, but also uh, in technology, in business model, as well as in managerial concept, you know. As of today, despite the fact China is number two in GDP, we have not produced many managerial concepts which can be which can be applied globally. So in this regard, our Asian economy have a long way to go in that regard. So we're still at probably in China, it's still the imitation state, but you do see some of this new breakthroughs. For example, you know, the digital transformation in China, the B2C side of China business is go as good as anyone, maybe globally leading. The AI driven application, China really neck to neck with the US, you know. And there's also it's the economic disruption side of China may be the leading ones. You know, in Korea, you have a Samsung, Samsung type of companies. In Japan, in Japan, they have a few really innovation driven companies. So that's a really good ones. In terms of COVID-19, I'm very positive the vaccine will come out. You know, this issues, I hope, you know, will be settled by end of next year. So economies can be, go, uh, can be back to normal. But fundamentally, I think it's important for us to be more integrated, you know, like uh, China, Korea, Japan, ASEAN, because by far the largest economic block, you know. So this is a big enough market, you know. So if the market is big enough, that will provide space for entrepreneurs and disruptors, not only from ASEAN country, but also from Korea from Japan and from China as well. That'd be a huge market for your ideas, for your talents, for your ingenuity to be leveraged upon. So for me, I wanna see more integration. Also, I wanna see more younger generation of entrepreneurs to be more open-minded about ideas, 
different ideas. You know, because we have so much diversity of a political system, but economically we're doing so well. So this is an, does not line well with these simple classification of authoritarian uh, democracy. You know what I mean? Okay, it's only zero, <laughs> one, or two. And also I want to younger generation to be more inclusive, more talent, uh, more, more, more tolerant, more compassion, more empathy, and more long-term oriented. The central idea is this, these, some of the critical solution to global issues, most depressing issues of humanity must come from our region, for our region to be fully respected globally. Thank you. Well, yeah. Bing mentions two important uh, uh, words. One is integration, the other is young generation, but let's put the young generation at the, at the last moment. And let's talk about this integration. It seems that inter-country, international, integration is important, especially in Southeast Asia and uh, Asia altogether. But uh, the same importance should go to intra, intra-country, intra-nation conflict. We have seen this intra-national uh, conflict I already in the United States in the last few months. But I understand that in most of the Southeast Asian countries, this intra-conflict in wealth, uh, ethnic diversity, and so on, seem to be uh, one of the headaches. And, not, and also in China, this wealth gap is growing. And are there any solutions for this intra-country integration? Joel, I'm sure that you have been witnessing this in Malaysia and other nearby countries. Wealth gap. Uh, yeah, yeah. So per perhaps personally, I uh, maybe from my personal experience. Um, so my parents were from a you know slightly lower middle class, I think uh, generation, in which uh, they work with the government. And I think uh, the first uh, number one is education. I think ability for um, you know the next generation to get quality education to move up. Uh, economic uh, mobility, right? Um, to to uh, you know earn more money, uh, to have better job opportunities. I think that's uh, important. Um, secondly, is that um, I, I guess there's always uh, some levels of racial tension anywhere in the world, right? Um, and I would say that Southeast Asia has been uh, quite a generally tolerant society. Uh, as compared to what you see in, say, for instance, like the Middle East or, or Africa, you know, where, um, you know, where religion or race is uh, utilized, right, as a reason for, for war. So therefore, um, you know, while there is still political and uh, sometimes racial uh, tensions, I think that Southeast Asian uh, countries in general has managed to live uh, peacefully uh, uh, together uh, and uh, also trying to bring together better governance uh, over the past 50 years. Uh, reducing the um, you know the corruption index as I shared earlier, and also ease to start businesses uh, in this region. So of course there's a lot more work to do. I think uh, Southeast Asia, I'd say, is in a good state, but it's not in a great state, and in which we uh, there's areas to improve. Well, I'm sure that this gap can also be taken care of by companies like Fave uh, from the younger generation, and I understand that among the decacons, which are the Country, the young companies with revenue of 10 billion or more, there are 20 in the world, 12 in the United States, five in China, but three uh, are scattered in Southeast Asia. You mentioned uh, uh, Grab and Gojek. These, these are becoming uh, Decacon. I'm sure that there will be days when Says will become another Decacon. And this activity, I'm sure that you, you, you know it, when it will happen, right? But, uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, Big Xiang, do you think, uh, what about this uh, generation, young generation, which has no fear for becoming uh, big? And do you think this will continue? And there will be days that the Southeast Asian countries, countries will have as many decacons uh, and unicorns like in the United States or China? Well, uh, let me try to address the question you had uh, before and then let's one together. Sure. And when I look at the, this uh, uh, 
the global issue of income wealth inequality, diminishing social mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, for US China, as measured by Gini coefficient, China is the second highest. US is the third highest. Brazil is number one, has been number one for decades. So China, US having the most serious income wealth inequality issues globally. And also the social security program in China rudimentary. According to many of these projections by experts or, 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 or the respectable institutions, two factors might deepening the income wealth gap. Number one, the potential job displacement about many of the disruptive technology, in particular the AI, robotic technology, and et cetera. And secondly, the COVID-19, the many studies showing that this income of wealth inequality issue becoming more serious become because of the two events. And then because of that, I think, see, I see some serious changes forthcoming. Number one, I see the rise of socialism globally. In a sense, the government need to be more proactive to use this social security program to redistribute wealth. So that's the reason why I see the rise of socialism globally, including China and the US. In the US, it's not a political right to talk about socialism. Actually, when I did a talk at Kennedy School a few years ago, one friend might say, you gotta be careful talking about socialism. Somebody might shoot you, you know. You know. But anyway, <laughs> if I stick to my gun, I think the socialism may have a, a strong possibility coming back globally. This is the governmental front. At the corporate from uh, the third level distribution wealth, U.S. the the, the philanthropy giving last year was about over two percent of U.S. GDP. For China, 0.01 percent. We're less than 0.01 percent of our. <laughs> we have a long way to go. So U.S. It, it should be respected for that for their generosity of the people yeah. uh, in giving back to community. So level one income inequality becoming worse. We need a government to be. Pro proactive, and we need a better culture of uh, giving back to community. At a corporate level, I see two major changes. Number one, I would like to see more modern corporations emerging from our region. In China, we have family business. We have state-owned enterprises. Japan is the only economy in our region with so many modern corporations like Toyota, not dominated by any family, not owned by government. So this is something we essentially need. Japan is noted for its you know, middle class, a vast majority of societies. In this regard, we need to learn from Japan. Right. China needs to learn from Japan in sure. that regard. Well, I'm Secondly, sure. mm -hmm. yeah, please. Well, I, the, one, the, one more sentence. The right. value or intention of the companies mm -hmm. must go beyond economic property, even in the US. You know, the chairman, CEO of the top 50 U.S. company last year got together. They need to make a statement, a social purpose of company. Yep. That's a sea change for U.S. Well, company. The issue you have mentioned, uh, the social, spreading socialism worldwide, uh, seems to be uh, worthwhile as a separate topic. And I'll ask Asian leadership organizer to invite you again for this topic. Well, since we have Thank only you. five minutes, why don't you spend one minute each to sum it up? Joel, one minute. Joel? Um, yes. All right. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I think re really privileged to be here. Uh, learning a lot from Professor, Professor Big Sam. I, I was taking down notes <laughs> around socialism, philanthropy, right? Building a company that has social purpose. Uh, relevant for me, I think my key takeaway here is that uh, we need to think of the future generation. Um, so therefore, even in my company, I think uh, it, in, in all different uh, startups or companies, we should be thinking about uh, a social purpose, right? Um, you know, beyond just uh, capitalism and, and making money uh, as a company. Um, yeah, and a great thought there around philanthropy and how we can give back, right? Um, to, to actually reduce that income gap. So thank you so much yeah, thank for, you. for this opportunity. Dean Zhang, one minute for you. Well, I, I, I'm still immensely positive about the future of this whole region of Asia. Mm -hmm. But I think the younger generation need to be more global in perspective and in responsibilities. Yes. We must contribute our share to come up with solutions for most pressing, some of the most pressing issues globally. We only 
can solve that problem by innovation. Not only in tech, in finance, in manufacturing, we also need to contribute to innovations, social type, social innovations. So that is very essential. So I'm, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for participating. Thank you, Professor Chu, for moderating. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Bing and Joel. So let me spend the last minute in summarizing what you've mentioned and one minute for the future. Well, uh, at the outset, Din Chang and uh, the CEO Neo are so different, so we might have uh, expected <laughs> some quarrel, but uh, difference in opinion, but it seems to me that two of you have made a beautiful integration of ideas into a kind of future uh, perspective, which is very bright. And thank you for that uh, sort of integration of your ideas into one. It seems that uh, the way we divide the whole world into Asia, Europe, America, seem to be the things of the past. Well, Ed Edward Hall, uh, the future social, uh, so uh, social science scholar, uh, once mentioned high context culture and low context culture, in which uh, and Asia was identified as one of the exam uh, example uh, high society culture. But nowadays, uh, the more important way to identify the characteristics of culture is generation rather than the countries. Young generations are the same. Joel, uh, Jukaboka, or other young generation, they are the same, regardless of where they are from. So it seems that uh, the reason why we think Asia, and especially Southeast Asia, uh, have bright future is because uh, these countries have a uh, young generation uh, much higher in percentage in, the, in their country than other countries. So young countries are the, are the characteristics of these countries. And these young generation are the same uh, and they are very dynamic, they are very uh, eager to be successful and future-oriented. So I'm sure that East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Asia all together will have bright future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.